Hey folks, welcome to my channel or welcome back. My name is Kat. I'm a licensed registered dietitian nutritionist and on this channel we like to talk about weight inclusive and weight neutral focused approaches to health as well as diving into scammy and in my opinion unethical nutrition related businesses, products, mostly nutrition related MLMs and other fear mongering nutrition related claims. Now in today's video we are talking about a MLM distributor, We're not talking about the distributor but discussing some of the reels, Instagram reels that a specific distributor has made. Now these reels are very much uh, in the what I would consider disordered approaches to nutrition to food and so if that is a trigger for you then I recommend that you might skip this video. Now I have covered this distributor in a past video. I'll still be blurring them out because I really want to focus on what they're saying and what they're sharing because in my opinion it's harmful. Now this specific distributor is working with Modere. I'm not sure about if they are still a distributor. I wasn't really deep diving into the person. I don't know too much about their history but the videos itself is what I want to focus on. So I will leave a link for that other video that I did but in this one we're just focusing on those videos. They are so many and I find them really frustrating. So with all that out of the way, let's go. All right, do you guys even know what's inside an Oreo? No? Let me show you. That's not even food. It's chemicals and a bunch of precious <laughs> that is lighting your insides on fire and killing you slowly. So you're right. One Oreo isn't destroying a diet. It's destroying your body. And sweetie, I have too much respect, love, admiration, and I value and honor my temple too much to let some bull like an Oreo come inside here. Just like I wouldn't let Joe the homeless guy come inside my body, I ain't letting no bull Oreo come in here either. Get some standards on what kinds of foods you allow in your body. It's not just about diet. It's about self-love and self-respect. Let's clarify something up front. So demonizing a specific food or food group is not really productive when we're talking about long-term health and sustainability and actions that support physical health and don't harm other aspects of health like mental, social, emotional well-being. And ultimately, in my opinion, it's helpful or important to focus on ways that we can do that because one of the effects or outcomes of the dieting industry, the wellness toxic industry, one of the outcomes of that is this kind of diet cycle getting on and off diets and with that also a lot of the times comes weight cycling now weight cycling is where someone might find themselves having cycled up to a weight having been on a lifetime full of diets I have a really big goal of trying to move people away from that because that puts stress on the body and that can be harmful right and so my goal and my what I you know, want to focus on as a registered dietitian, as a health professional, is really helping people with their health. And so if I know something has a high likelihood of causing this kind of cycling in someone's life that's gonna put some stress on the body or put more stress on the body than what is needed, when we have this other way of approaching it that allows for more sustainability, flexibility, and doesn't harm those other aspects of health, then I'm gonna choose that route. So just kind of starting off, this is the approach that I am going to with like that viewpoint as I'm watching these videos and commenting about these videos. Just wanted to give that kind of overview up front, especially if you are newer to this channel. Now, while it is essential, in my opinion, again, as someone who is focused on a physical health side of things and not wanting to cause harm in other aspects of health, I think it is important that we can talk about foods that are maybe more nutrient dense and also foods that maybe in context don't really make the most sense for that person if they are really wanting to focus on their physical health. Now that doesn't mean that they have to completely cut that out unless it's something like they're allergic to or it's old or moldy or anything like that. But branding a specific food as like universally bad can contribute to an unhealthy relationship with food. And when she said like it's lighting up your insides, like that is not evidence-based. It promotes this kind of fear and mistrust of food. It is essential, in my opinion, to approach food with a balanced perspective and really see the nuances of how foods and on the spectrum of their nutrient density can play a role in our energy levels, in our joy, and just our overall experience around food. Remember, food is not just fuel. Yes, it gives us the energy, but it also can provide joy, comfort, celebration, culture, and so much more. And equating one's own worth in comparison to the foods that they are choosing, in my opinion, is a slippery slope. 
Everyone has their reasons for eating the way that they do, but it's crucial to remember that our value is not determined whatsoever by the foods that we eat or the amounts that we eat. Now, I don't really have much to say about the part where she was talking about the person and how it related to not going into her body. That's just not my style of content. And I recognize that everyone has their own personality. And I think that's a good thing, right? We don't wanna change ourselves to how we are perceived online. Like in my opinion, I think it's easiest to be like, you to be as authentic right so we have a very different approach to content making and what she feels comfortable with saying i would not but i think that it is worth saying that comparison makes it seem like the food has really that impact of your like self-worth, which I do think that can be harmful. So in summary of my thoughts of that specific video, while I think it's okay to advocate for nutrient rich food intake, I think it's important to have like accuracy in that and not this kind of inflammatory, this food is gonna light up your insides kind of messaging. I wanna foster a more food inclusive, food neutral perspective and really encouraging the idea that foods can, that there can be room for various kinds of foods in an overall nutrient dense intake and it doesn't have to be this kind of extreme thing either way. Let's watch the next video. For those of you who are blaming your trauma, your disease, your mental health, your depression, your anxiety, for those of you who are blaming any of those things for the reason why you are fat, overweight, or obese, you're giving all of those things more power than you're giving yourself. And you are made by God. So I say, F that. Get your power back. Those things are not reasons why you are unhealthy. You are the reason why you are unhealthy because you have the power to make different choices. You have the power to look at each and every one of those things in the face and say, F you, you are not going to win. This video particularly made me very frustrated. It emphasizes this kind of personal responsibility over people's trauma, over factors like the connection between trauma and disease and mental health conditions when it comes to health and weight. It is important to recognize that health outcomes aren't just the outcome or the effect of our willpower or determination. Personal choices, like individual choices, can play a role in those, but they are not the causation of those. When we look at evidence-based practice, we see that there are multiple other areas that are involved, the environment, the overall social determinants of health. Like they are called social determinants of health for a reason because there is actual evidence of how much those play a role in someone's health and the outcomes and conditions more than like when you look at the big picture we see just a small amount for the intake and like activity levels and things that are more within control and so yes those play a role and it would be you know not evidence-based to say that they're completely don't make a difference or they can't that they can't make a difference but at that same time we can also see that it is not just those things and if somebody has those really challenging outcomes it is really important to not put the blame on them for those because in reality it is probably a lot of different factors that are outside of their control that played a role in that and suggesting that someone's trauma or disease or mental health status aren't valid reasons for someone's state like their health status that is just an oversimplification and really like victim blamey it dismisses the complexities of genetics and environment so socioeconomic factors, and so much more. And also it is essential to note or to remember that health isn't like solely reflected on weight or the opposite. Implying that these people just need to like overcome their trauma, their challenges, it oversimplifies it for many people. It's like telling someone with a broken leg to just walk it off. If somebody has a broken leg, there are so many different kinds of support that they're going to need, right? Like their healthcare team 
is a mixture of multiple different people. So like transfer that, that broken leg that someone needs help with to continue on moving forward, not just saying like walk it off. The same thing we can see that for like mental health side of things or like chronic conditions. I believe she said that she has Hashimoto's. Like I can talk for someone too, like that. <laughs> that's something that I also deal with. And I do believe that a big part of what kind of pushed that off was a lot of stress that was outside of my control. I probably could have had better like stress management, but there was just a lot going on in my life while my husband was overseas and just a whole lot to where I really think the stress and just the overwhelm that I was feeling really like kicked that off. While I was still doing things, I was still consuming nutrient dense foods mostly, I was physically active and in fact maybe too active in the gym as well because I was trying to kind of deal with that stress. And so I just think like before making assumptions on people's health and their like chronic conditions what may happen kind of as a side note so sometimes i'll have prenatal clients and they'll really be scared because this is the first time they're reaching out to a dietitian and it's because they found out that they had gestational diabetes and they think that is something that they caused when and that's not the case that's not the pathophysiology of gestational diabetes and so i think that the idea of putting this blame on the person for their chronic health conditions or for their health conditions it just puts a lot of assumptions and judgments on that person and when we're talking about health we and I'll, I'll bring this up a little more later with another video but we can't shame somebody into better health and it just makes me so mad when I experience someone or I see someone who is just I'm not mad at them when they just feel so bad for having a chronic condition because I do a lot of medical nutrition therapy work and it is really heartbreaking when I see someone who has a chronic health condition who thinks who is like putting the blame on themselves. Sometimes people can try to be the most healthy that they can be and they can still get something devastating health wise, outcome wise. We can't see how someone is the health of someone. We can't base that just on their weight and how they look from the outside. We, we can't tell what's going on on the inside. And so I think that that is just a very dangerous kind of message to put out there and yeah, not a fan of it. And I mean, I'm laughing. That's just kind of like how I, I process sometimes. And it's not funny, but I'm just kind of, if you're wondering like why I'm laughing, it's not cool. All right, let's continue on. Let's go to the next video. But you don't understand. I have three kids, a full-time job. And like, I'm just so stressed all the time. Also, I travel a lot. And like, I love going out to eat with my friends. Also drinking wine. And like, I have this toe that like won't bend. No, you don't understand. Like my kids won't let me work out. My life is just really hard. I really hate to say this, but blah, 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 blah. So in this video, she's kind of portraying what she hears as these kind of like excuses. You know, having children and demanding jobs, physical limitations, the simple joys of like, eating foods, maybe having some wine. Now, those excuses that she was talking about, especially like regarding the job and the kids, those aren't like excuses. Those are real life situations, scenarios that many people navigate on a daily basis. Now, if somebody has made their job, their career focused around health, then more than like, and sometimes this is not always the case because sometimes people kind of put their health on the backside while they are like helping other people. But for a lot of times, especially for this content creator, like they have centered their life around health from what I can see. And so their ability to implement that is going to look Look different they're going to have a different setup having a plate full with both like professional life and personal life that can like make it hard on people to prioritize their health if if they are not focused like on health if that's like not their number one thing which it seems like it is for this content creator and remember health and wellness that is multifaceted it's not when we talk about health i often bring up that definition it's not just physical health but also mental social and emotional well-being and so when we're trying to focus and, and juggle all of those different areas that can be really challenging for many people and 
And even beyond that, everyone's definition of what a like fulfilling life means can look different. Someone might not like moving physically in the same way that I do. They might have a different kind of joyful movement, or they might really like struggle with that area of finding like any movement joyful. Maybe they haven't found one. That does not mean that like our lives are like difference in value. That doesn't mean that they are any less fulfilled than I am, right? Like everybody has different joys and that is okay. Some people like running marathons. I can't see myself doing a marathon. Like that was a like slight goal that I wanted to have when I was in my like early 20s or late teens. But I really have no desire to do that right now. Maybe I'll change my mind down the line. But for some, their desire might be running marathons. For other, they might get that same kind of joy out of having a meal with their family. Neither is like more valid than the other. Instead of like dismissing and mocking real challenges that people experience, I think a better approach is really understanding and recognizing like where can we be a little bit more compassionate in recognizing that and how can we maybe meet in a middle where you can see like if that is someone's goal that they really want to focus and start prioritizing a little bit higher on their list their physical health what can we do that is sustainable for them when I'm working on like goal setting and action planning between sessions I really like to encourage people to choose something that they know that they can accomplish and they feel that they're like at a 9 or a 10 out of a scale of 1 to 10 that they feel that they can accomplish add a nine or a 10, that almost feels too easy. And the point of that is really to encourage this kind of self-efficacy or this kind of like confidence and, and really starting to get the ball rolling on things that we can start like stacking on top of that other kind of health actions, health promoting or health supporting actions. And so like when I hear those kind of, because they're not excuses, like they are reasons why somebody is struggling with maybe being able to prioritize certain parts of their physical health that they really wanna focus on but have a hard time kind of seeing the bigger picture and how that might play out in real life when I hear those like I don't hear what she heard like the blah 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 no I'm hearing that you have a lot going on how do you kind of see your life a little bit different when you look like three months from now or half a year from now a year from now and then how can we kind of work backwards from that like what what can we do to find that is realistic and that is fun? I just can't imagine like going to someone asking for help and knowing that they're kind of just seeing my reasons, my real reasons of why what's been keeping me like not moving forward as this kind of like excuse. Like there is a difference. Those are reasons, not excuses. Maybe their perspective is something that we can kind of work on and stuff, but just like, it's just, it lacks any kind of empathy or understanding. And I think it is important when working in a field like nutritional sciences, because while there is those kind of hard sciences, biochem, anatomy, physiology, genetics, and all that stuff, it is also a part of soft science, the anthropology, sociology, psychology, and those are important to keep in mind at the same time. Let's continue. My job as your coach is not to agree with you. It is not to adapt to you. It is not to accept you in the state that you're in. My job as your coach is to move you forward. It is to point out the shit that is keeping you stuck, miserable, unhappy, and to move you the fuck out of there. My job as your coach is to be honest with you and to show you what the fuck is killing you and then show you how to live. So this video emphasizes this coach's or this distributor's view of coaching as this role of like stark honesty, pinpointing perceived flaws, and pushing aggressive for change. But as Dr. Kristen Neff has explained before, and I've talked about her, I'm gonna pull up my notes. I'm a big fan of Dr. Kristen Neff. She is a leading researcher in the area of self-compassion, and I have incorporated her work so much in my practice and she has a really wonderful website about self-compassion really breaking that down and what the role of that is in health how that fits in i will leave information for that down below but her self-compassion research really suggests that sustainable change often emerges from kindness and understanding and this kind of like mindful self-compassion that really emphasizes being present with our feelings without judgment acknowledging pain without exaggerating it 
moment and recognizing that setbacks are a part of a shared human experience. And through her like principles and focus or breakdown of self-compassion and what that looks like, individuals are often better positioned to face challenges and really cultivate this resilience to continue with their health actions, with their actions that support their health. And when I hear her saying that like her job as a coach, so there are kind of um, different ways that you can become a board certified health coach. I think if you are going to a health coach who is not like a, um, or, you know, a registered dietitian or anything, I think that can be really helpful for kind of understanding more of their background. Typically, if they are a board certified health coach, if they're going through that board certification, they have to do a specific course that has requirements. And then there's multiple different courses that can fit that, um, that can fit those requirements. But then they also have to do additional kind of hours and also um, like training or supervised practice or like a practice exam kind of thing and then also um, continuing education or the exam and then continuing education. So like that, there is an option for that as well. And if you're gonna find someone like that, they have been through a course or through a program that really breaks down and, and implements the idea of motivational interviewing because motivational interviewing is very, very evidence-based for sustainable change and for that kind of just evidence-based care when it comes to like health coaching and the implementation of that. I think the term health coaching is really watered down. Like someone can say they're a health coach and it really doesn't mean that much without knowing because anyone can basically call themselves that, right? Like there is no like set standard. And so I think that that is a case for a health coach. If you are a health coach or wanting to be one, I really encourage you to kind of look into how maybe you can get a board certified in that because that just, it gives more legitimacy to the profession. And I think it's really valuable and helpful, not just for that coach, but for the coach's clients. Now that is something that I did like decide to add on. I'm a registered dietitian, but within just being a dietitian, like you can focus in so many different areas. Some some dietitians are focused in like school nutrition or clinical nutrition or um, research or teaching or just various other things. And so I really wanted to focus in on the coaching side of things. And so I did go out and do that additional kind of board certification in health coaching. But really going back to the idea of motivational interviewing, that has shown significant improvements or significant significant like promise in facilitating improvements of behavior change. It really emphasizes this idea of collaboration with the coach and the client. This collaboration over a confrontation. The goal is to really like evoke one's own like internal motivation or reason for change and really respecting the individual's autonomy. And that is completely absent from the video that we just watched. While it might resonate with a few, it can feel confrontational and just counterproductive and really like push people to stay where they're at. And I'm not just saying this like anecdotally, that makes sense, but evidence-based wise, motivational interviewing wise, like so many different areas and, and evidence in behavior change, it's just the effectiveness of what we see in this video. Like while that can light someone's booty on fire to really focus in for a you know very specific short amount of time, I'm really curious long-term how that is helping someone because it doesn't take into account that long-term kind of focused approach for sustainability. Lasting progress, look at evidence. It comes from that place of understand, self-understanding and that kind of internal motivation rather than this external kind of fear or shame or even worse like external that becomes internal simply put we cannot shame our way to health it's not effective and even worse in my opinion it's harmful let's go on to the next video I hate the way i look i hate the way i feel i'm so sick of this excess weight and i'm so tired all the time and i can't play with my kids and i just I feel miserable, I'll do anything. Wait, 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 I can't have wine while I'm trying to lose weight? No sugar, gluten, or dairy, that's so restrictive. Like, what am I supposed to eat? You're sure like not even one glass of wine? Like, 
on a Friday or Saturday night. One, just one. Low carb, I don't know. Yikes, I don't have time to work out every day. That's how you sound. Yes, you. You who is miserable in her own body, who doesn't like to look at herself, who is getting awful sleep, who has foggy brain, whose joints hurt, who stopped having sex with her husband because she's too ashamed of her own naked body, who doesn't play with her kids anymore because she has no energy, who's lost all confidence because you can't keep your promises to yourself. You want to tell me that the wine and the gluten and the sugar and the dairy is more important than how you feel about yourself, more important than your confidence, more important than the ability to play with your children, more important than being intimate with your husband? Cut your shit. Okay, so many people can feel frustrated or like desperate or just like sadness when or about their body, especially after going through big changes or even not after going through big changes, just in general. And in my opinion, it's, it's important to have an empathetic kind of space for that as a health coach, as this person is being portrayed as or is wanting to be portrayed as. And however, at that same time, when it comes to approaching someone's health, their wellness, their body image, it's crucial to do so with understanding and kindness rather than judgment and shame. Blanket prescriptions or recommendations like avoiding the gluten and the sugar and the dairy, like that might work for some, but they can feel overly restrictive to others. And I don't want anybody to hear that and kind of take that out of context and be like, this dietitian is recommending people to drink wine or whatever. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that she is seeing this very much as this kind of black or white thing. And especially when it comes to the food side of things, the gluten, the sugar, the, what was the other thing? the dairy, you don't need to cut those out to improve health. Unless you have a real reason to, if someone has celiac disease or they cannot have dairy for a specific reason, there is no need to like just blanket cut out those foods. Using someone's like emotional vulnerabilities as a leverage, like the relationship with their partner or their kids, that is not effective coaching. Like shaming someone to make them feel guilty about their choices. It only perpetuates this kind of negative cycle of food beliefs and toxic dieting habits, behaviors, those behaviors that are associated with that. Like if you've ever felt like you've been kind of attacked with those kind of messages, and I encourage you to seek support from professionals who approach your health and well-being with compassion and understanding and even more so on the same level research or evidence-backed care because that lasting change that consistent change really comes from self-kindness and self-love and understanding not shame and guilt let's continue on so this one the audio was taken out for some reason but she says are you a picky eater and then she says if you answered yes here's a tip for you picky eating is for toddlers and children so put those big girl pants on stop wanting party in your mouth every time you eat look where that got you which is so out of pocket and start eating for your health and like that that's the video now food preferences can vary throughout someone's life while we often can associate picky eating with like toddlers or children, there are countless adults who for various reasons have a limited range of foods that they consume regularly that they feel comfortable with and that's okay. Food preferences can be related to a variety of reasons, whether it's like sensory sensitivities or trauma or past traumas related to food, cultural or family traditions, medical conditions, just to name a few. To imply that these preferences is simply a matter of like putting your big girl pants on is not only dismissive, but it oversimplifies a multifaceted issue. And the idea of like wanting to party inside of your mouth every time you eat, like food is not just fuel. It can be a source of enjoyment, cultural expression, and social bonding. And it's natural to want our foods to be a pleasurable experience. If someone's picky eating is like causing some issues in their health, the solution isn't shame. I would encourage them to seek the support from a health professional. Uh, there's a lot of dietitians who specialize in like called picky eating, but it could be, you know, for a variety of other reasons. There are so many dietitians who specialize in that and that could be a helpful step where they could look at that like individual's needs. Let's continue on. We're getting to the last video. Let's go. This one's a little longer. You guys want to know why it sometimes looks like Life is easier for people who are successful. 
and why a lot of times successful people have horrible childhoods or have gone through is because builds resilience and that's why we do hard that's why we choose to challenge ourselves and do things we're afraid of do things we don't think we can do things that suck okay like doing an hour and a half workout by Snez who's killing me and pushing me to my next level in fitness to then running one and a half miles to then doing cold plunges right when I wake up you guys that's to build resilience strength so it's really not just about like a diet you know or losing weight the decisions and the habits and the choices that a person makes to get those results are hard and they build resilience and they build mental toughness and they build better mental health if you're constantly giving in to all this shit that you want right if you're constantly saying ah i deserve that drink i'm gonna drink you're not building any resilience so the more you can resist those things and say no to them the more resilience you build the better your mental health will be the more you'll believe in yourself and trust yourself the more you'll empower yourself and when you choose to go do a workout even though you don't feel like it you're building more resilience and then you get stronger so handling life is easier and you create better don't you want your kids to be resilient show them how to be resilient like just give up something you really enjoy people are asking me why i gave up oat butter it's not that it's not healthy it's that i really enjoy it a little too much too often right like a spoonful after breakfast after lunch after dinner like not okay I'm enjoying it a little too much so to build resilience and build strength in myself I'm gonna remove something I find comfort in something that I really really enjoy just remove it for a little bit build some resilience gain my control back around it get uncomfortable like every time I think about oat butter I have to be like no that builds some mother in power yo and yeah it might sound stupid to some of you but what is something that you can give up today that you really enjoy that you know like it's gonna be tough saying no to and just give it up for a month so the idea that facing challenges can build resilience like yeah hardships can shape us they can teach us we can learn a lot from them they can help teach us to cope and adapt and eventually thrive but i think it's essential to differentiate between like resilience born from like life just circumstances and experiences versus like these self-imposed challenges that may not be sustainable or even beneficial not everybody's path is going to look like that though resilience doesn't only come from your life being hard resilience can also be like nurtured through self-compassion as dr kristen neff's work has shown being kind to oneself recognizing our shared humanity and practicing that mindfulness and just like presence can be powerful tools in the mental strength area and doing these kind of like intense um, challenges like pushing oneself excessively consistently can lead to this kind of burnout or injuries or other health issues right so it doesn't have to be this kind of like all or nothing thing you're taking away something that you really enjoy or love like like she encouraged us to do and denying one's like pleasure of something can actually lead to that whole pendulum swing of restriction and then overindulgence or like binging so like the idea of challenging oneself i i think it, it has value but it's important to ensure that those challenges are not these like arbitrary tests of like willpower and evidence base wise it's really best to kind of approach these long-term sustainable habits with balance and self-awareness and self-compassion rather than guilt and shaming yourself out of an action and like i can't even think of something that i love so much that i haven't approached like mindfully or like within context you know I, I talk about um the approaching of food with curiosity compassion and context and really there's nothing that i can think of that i would like taking it away out of my intake for 30 days that would do any difference like positively and that's not to say that like i have perfect intake or anything because one there's no such thing as perfect intake but there's room for everything 
So overall, in conclusion, from the first video that I did related to the content of this distributor to this video, it doesn't seem like much has changed. There is kind of one like overall theme or whatever you want to call it that I see as like a takeaway from this. And that is that well-being is multifaceted and we can't shame someone into health. Shaming or promoting these kind of like overly rigid recommendations can not only be not like helpful, they can be harmful. Remember that resilience is not just about like arbitrarily removing things that we love. It's also about nurturing our mental and emotional well-being and those strengths and standing up against misinformation. So with that being said, let me know your thoughts on this video, on those video clips that we watched. If you have not liked this video, please do so and make sure you're subscribed. I would greatly appreciate that. And that wraps it up for this video. Remember, you can strive for health without subscribing to Diet Culture and without giving up your favorite thing for 30 days. <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye.